Okay, at this time, we have the pleasure of hearing from Mr. Barnabas Grayson, and he has got a message entitled, I Am the Good Shepherd. I remember the last time I was gave a sermon here, I had forgotten the uh, thing here, and um, I got it today when Rick called, and he said, Mr. Grayson, calling Mr. Grayson, please report to, uh, well, you know, the booth or whatever it is back there. Chill went down my spine. I said, what have I done? What did I do? It reminded me of when I was in high school, maybe junior high. <laughs> But Okay, um, there are some uh, handouts being uh, handed to you, I guess, by now. I am the good shepherd. That's what Jesus said. And he also said that he is the door of the sheep. So what do we see in these two self-portraits that we read about that our Savior said? And what do they tell us about our relationship with Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10. It says. Before we read where, we read where Jesus said these I am statements. I am the good shepherd. What is it all about? What does he want us to picture in seeing all this? Now we know that many of the Old Testament uh, patriarchs. Were shepherds in the literal sense. There was, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and uh, Moses and David. We know that rulers were sometimes called, they call their uh, subjects sheep. And some might say, as I've heard in some recent times, recent years, call them sheeple. Some who don't really know what uh, they're following, but do so. And then there are the priests or the pastors, and they're known as shepherds. And in Isaiah chapter 53, you know, verse 6, it says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Many have turned and gone their own way. Nevertheless, the Lord laid upon him, the good shepherd, the iniquity of us all. So, we read in, then in Psalm 23, we read that the Lord is our shepherd and that we shall not want. So in John chapter 10, we read where Jesus said, I am the door for the sheep. And he says, I am the good shepherd. So these two self-portraits there in chapter 10 are the fourth and fifth of the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the book of of John chapter 10 from you know previous sermons you may remember that Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life that I am the bread of life and I am the light of the world so in John chapter 10 verse 11 I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep so how did Jesus qualify this statement the self portrait of himself well, it was by this. He said that the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He came to lay down his life for his sheep. So who are the sheep? Who are the sheep? Today we know it applies to people like you. And it applies to me. And to those who were before us. And to those who are presently with us. And to those who are yet to come they are those who belong to the Lord but metaphorically <clears throat> when he spoke to his disciples of sheep he was speaking to the house of Israel in Matthew chapter 10 we okay let me finish uh, John 10 12 I see I don't know if I have that there but but he that is a hireling if we'll go up I uh, didn't write that scripture down Well, let's go on to Matthew 10. We'll skip over that for right now. Matthew 10. Um, 
when he had called unto him, this is Jesus, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And he gave the names of the apostles. And he told uh, the names of each one of these. But dropping on down to verse 5. Jesus sent them forth. And he commanded them saying. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans. Don't enter. Enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. Do this he said. Preaching the kingdom of that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in this first mission we see that the apostles were not to preach to any other people. But to the lost house of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Until they either repented or refused Christ Jesus. But they, but they were to heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out devils. And you know they had many afflictions. And many of them were lost because with all these afflictions, with all these problems that were the, the disciples had to go and take care of, they were lost. They were without hope in many ways. So we see where Paul and Barnabas went to the Jews and they declared the gospel of Jesus Christ, carrying on that message that uh, he gave to his disciples. But they remained set. In their ways. They weren't willing to change. They were disbelieving what the prophet said. About the coming Messiah. Who spoke. Uh, of, uh, of Jesus. As a son of God. But he came to show them the way. He came to show them the truth. And he came to show them. The life. And he said I am come. That you might, that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. So some would think, well, you know, here's the prosperity gospel that uh, he's come to preach. But he came that we might live this life in faith. That we might live this gospel of truth. That we might live it with charity. Not as one who is lost in the darkness of this world, but to live in the light and to repent and to believe the good news. And that there is coming the kingdom of heaven for it is at hand. But yet we read where his own received him not. They did not believe he was the prophesied Messiah that was to come. They believed in God but only one God. And that Jesus was not his son. So today we have a lot of religious forces in the world. Where a lot of people are being deceived by words. And deeds and other actions. And as though it is all prepared. As it was then by Satan. That when Christ come they would reject him. That they would disbelieve him. Just as there is in our world today. Saying well there's no Jesus. There's no God. There is no kingdom of heaven. But we see that the good shepherd. Gave his life for his sheep. In spite of all those things. Those iniquities. Those disbelieving things that they had he gave his life for his sheep and they crucified him nailed him to the stake rejected his ways rejected the life he was living as an example and he said of their deeds in spite of all that father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing they know not what they do so they would not partake of that bread of life. They would not. Put themselves into the light of God's word. John chapter 3. Uh, uh, verse 18. Let's just go down to verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That is the decision. The judgment. That light has come. Into the world. And. But men. Love darkness. Rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. They were deceived by the pleasures of sin. Everyone around them was doing it. And so they didn't really know the right way. For everyone. Verse 20. For everyone that does evil. Hates the light. Neither comes to the light. 
lest his deeds should be uh, reproved. They don't want to be preached to. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want to know that what they are doing is contrary to the light that is in Jesus Christ. Still we read <clears throat> that the love and teachings of the good shepherd for his sheep carried on. All, at, all of us at one time have had sadness in our life. All have had committed sin. All have had some shame perhaps put upon them. All have had bad things happen to them. All have been slighted or persecuted in some way. All have been lost not knowing which way to go. And then somehow some way the goodness of God led them to repentance through Jesus Christ his son. Let's go to Matthew, uh, Brian, I don't know what happened here. I do know what happened, I just put it down wrong. Matthew 18, I want to read this, verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How thank you. If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not... Leave the ninety and nine and goes into the mountains and seeks that which is gone astray. Goes everywhere, the rugged places, places that you would be hard to find anything. But he goes in order to look for that lost sheep. In verse 13, and if so be that he find it, truly I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which, not, which went not astray. Sometimes in life, you know, when things don't go your way, like in some of the uh, school shootings and the mall shootings that we've had, the parents go there. They want to know where they're lost, if uh, they've lost a child or not, and they go to look. And so they happen to be fortunate enough to have their child or their loved one spared, they rejoice. And in the same way, there is rejoicing when the lost is found. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. But we see that some were blinded to this love and to this mercy of God. It was taken for granted. Even as some today choosing instead not to see Jesus as the way out of darkness. Acts chapter 13 verse 41. And here is the attitude that of those that didn't want to face the truth. Didn't want to face the life. Jesus. His correction. Acts 13 verse 41. Behold you despisers. And wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days. A work which you shall in no wise believe. Though a man declare it unto you. As NIV translates it. Look you scoffers. Marvel and perish. For I am going to do something in your days. That you would never believe. If someone told you. And so that saying did affect a lot of people who were listening, who were hearing these words, these statements being made. In verse 42, where the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day. Came almost the whole city. Almost the whole city. Together to hear. The word of God. Now when the Jews saw the multitude. Human nature took over. And they were filled. With envy. Jealousy. And they spoke against those things. Which were spoken by Paul. Contradicting and blasphemy. 
Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of, a, ever, of everlasting life, though we turn to the, to the Gentiles. So even in our day today, the words of the good shepherd are disbelieved and rejected. Verse 47. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light of the Gentiles. And you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published. It was spread throughout the region, all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city. And they raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You remember in, in, in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes were blessed are you when men shall say all manner of evil against you and that you're persecuted for righteousness sake. But the disciples and the apostle Paul himself was filled with joy upon coming to know the love of Christ and the purpose for why he came and that was to save the sinner. Not only, you know, the tribes of Israel, but also the tribes of all uh, mankind. I need to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. So used to writing things on a sheet of paper that sometimes I forget how to turn the pages in the Bible. First uh, Timothy chapter 1. Where it says. Starting with verse 11. According to the glorious. Gospel of the blessed. God which was committed. To my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Who has enabled me. For that he counted me faithful. Putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. It's these uh, verses here 13, 14, 15, 16 that can apply to what we came out of. To how we were before we began to look to the good shepherd this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy for that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting now unto the king eternal immortal invisible the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever uh, amen so we see how the apostle Paul and those who looked to his example and saw his example of the mercy that was shown to him by Jesus Christ could also look to the same uh, in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin John chapter 10 verse uh, 14 again I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine he knows his sheep he knows his people he knows who they are he knows their name he knows what they do and he, am, uh, he is known of them as the father knows me even so I know the father 
And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have. You know, salvation is not just for the Jews. It's also for uh, all men, all mankind, all the tribes which are not of this fold. Them also, he says, I must bring and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And you know that day is still yet to come. Verse 16 says, as the NIV puts it, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. And they too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. We're familiar perhaps with Romans 2, 4 where it says that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It leads one to change uh, their life. As I uh, went through earlier about, you know, we all sometimes have sadness in life, bad things happening to us in life. Something uh, that leads to repentance. Because once you find out what sin is, and that is the transgression of the law, we realize that we are deserving of the death penalty for transgressing the law of God. So we have to look to Christ in order to have forgiveness and redemption through the sacrifice of his son. All have sinned. And so in Romans chapter 3, we see how this age is described. A picture is painted. A portrait of this age is painted. Verse 10. But we see it in words. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know what. That what things soever the law says. It says to them who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Go to verse 23. <clears throat> be brief a little bit. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. You know even in our own righteousness. We're still going to sin. We're still going to be imperfect. But we have the grace of God. The loving grace of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. Through the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation. Through faith in his blood. That is his sacrifice. To know what that sacrifice has done. To declare his righteousness. For the remission of sins. That are passed through the forbearance. Of God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus so the good shepherd came to give his life for his sheep and to lay down his life for all men now part two of this is in again in John chapter 10 where he says I am the door <clears throat> of the sheep. As I mentioned probably. Uh, maybe last week. Or the last time I spoke. Uh, that you know we can see sheep. From our backyard. And. Uh, whenever the owner. Comes down. Toward the, uh, the gate. Where the sheep are. They, they can be on the other side. Of the pasture. And they recognize him. And they go right toward him. They can hear his voice. And whenever they come to my side uh, of the fence. And the owners know we're around. They know they're going to come to uh, 
maybe get some food to eat. And, uh, but I, I can't get any closer without them backing up because they know that I am not their, their shepherd. And one day, uh, we have a dog, of course. Most everybody has a dog, right? But uh, we have this little uh, uh, kind of, it's kind of an odd shaped uh, thing you throw and they catch it. It's made out of cloth. Well, sometimes he'll catch it and he'll just shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it like he's killing something. Anyway, I looked over at the fence and the sheep were there and they were all standing still and they were looking. They had never seen uh, my dog do that. And I thought it was kind of funny in a way and <clears throat> little by little they gradually started backing up backing up away from the fence because something was going on with with my dog and not only that my cat there on the sidewalk our cat there on the sidewalk she had never seen the dog do that either and so I looked at her and uh, she was crouched as low as she could get her ears pinned back because of what was going on. Here was this vicious looking uh, dog making all kinds of sounds. And the sheep by that time had gone to the far side of the pasture. But the sheep only know their master. They may venture toward the edge. And sometimes it's what we do. We go astray even toward the edge. And we could be in danger of what's beyond that fence. And only the master can enter. Uh, let me go ahead and read. Start verse 1. I don't want to get too far gone. Verily, uh, verily I say unto you. He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold. But climbs up some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. And he was talking about the Pharisees. And their hypocrisy. And their deception. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You know, a door is like a portal or a gateway, an entranceway. <clears throat> and to him, verse 3, the porter, that is the doorkeeper, opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I don't know if they got name for the sheep. They say if you name an animal that you're going to slaughter, you know, later on, you don't really want to get that close to it. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice only it's only the sheep that will follow the shepherd out of the gate because they feel safe they know who he is they know where he's going and on the other hand you've got uh, you've got cattle cattle you know they have to be driven out through the gate but only the sheep will follow the voice and the lead of the shepherd verse 5 but a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they didn't understand what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Truly I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Like that song we heard in the beginning, you know, oh, he opens the life gate that all may go in. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I think I mentioned one time that I had counted 13 sheep out there. Every time I do, I go to sleep. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there was one day I thought, well, I counted 12. And I thought, well, I probably miscounted. And uh, later, a day or two later, <clears throat> I, I saw either the owners had gone ahead and uh, and, and butchered the, the sheep because there were a lot of uh, a lot of tables and chairs up there near the backyard of their home. I noticed that there were uh, buzzards. You know, they were flying around, circling around. They landed on the ground, 
and there was something white on, on, the, on the ground. And that's where that 13th sheep was. And so and there was only 12. And, you know, I felt a bit of sadness knowing that this, this sheep uh, had given its life for some reason or other. Let's see. Uh, let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 7. Brian, if we can pull that up. This love of God, this mercy of God, this kindness of, of God that Jesus himself exemplified when he was here. He said in verse 9, What man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, ask for something to eat, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, it's that, the, the old golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Then, <clears throat> verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's, you know, that's the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way which that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, few there be that find it. That life gate is narrow. And when one sees... That this life gate is open to them. They hear the word. They hear it preached. But then they say. You mean you guys meet on Saturday. That gate narrows a little bit more. And then they see. Well there's the holy days. That gate narrows. Even closer together. And then there's. Closes a little more. And they find out there is. Unclean and clean food. That you have to be aware of. No more unclean meats. So it is a straight and narrow gate. Luke chapter 13 now. I think I've got (laughs) Brian kind of uh, searching now. But he's good. Look at that. It's already up there. Thank you, Brian. Luke chapter 13, verse 19. Well, verse 18, I'll start there. Then said uh, Jesus unto, unto what is the kingdom of God like? What is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I resemble it or compare it, he said. Well, he said it's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew. You know, we're, we're like that seed. Started out, starting out small and now expanding into that kingdom of Of God that is to come. And waxed a great tree. And the fowls of the air lodged. In the branches of it. Again he said. Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God. It is like leaven he said. Which a woman took. And hid in three measures of meal. Till the whole was leaven. uh, Swolled up. And he went through the cities and villages. Teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And then said one unto him. This much debated question. Lord are there few that be saved. And he said unto them. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many I say unto you will seek to enter in. As shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up. And has shut the door. And you begin to stand outside. And to knock at the door saying. Lord Lord open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you. I don't know. I know not whence you are. I don't know who you are. Then shall ye begin to say. Well we've eaten and drunk in your presence. And you have taught in our streets. But I shall. But he shall say. I tell you. I know not whence you are. Depart from me. You workers. All you workers of iniquity. Then there shall be weeping. And gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham. And Isaac. And Jacob. And all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves thrust out. 
And they shall come from the east, and from the west, and from the north, and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, they're going to be settled in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Hebrews chapter 13. Now the God of peace, verse 20, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Now if you had your pen or your pencil, it could outline that in the Bible. It's through Jesus Christ to whom be glory. Forever and ever. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31. When the son of man shall come in his glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This will take place. Of course you know in the future. When at the millennial reign of Christ. And before him shall be gathered all the nations. <clears throat> and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Dividing those that are saved from the lost. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. But the goats on the left. Kind of like, you know, like the wheat and the tares. Then shall the king say to them that are on the right hand. Come you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know it says elsewhere that if they have, if you have not the spirit of God. You are none of his. Acts chapter 4. I won't uh, Acts chapter 4 very good verse 10 be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead even by him does this man stand here before you whole this was you know concerning that uh, sick and that feeble man who, who was impotent he was healed this is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, no other authority, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. That's because he's the life gate. He's the gate of the sheep. And that means salvation for both Jew and Gentiles. Romans chapter 10. Uh, just one scripture there. You won't need to go to that. <clears throat> if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And shall believe in him. In your heart. That God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. So Jesus being risen from the dead. That means Jesus still exists. That he is the I am still. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. First Peter chapter 2. For even hereunto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So it is through his sacrifice that we can be he can find us if we get lost and get back into the fold. Be led back. Because the good shepherd seeks that which was lost. One more uh, reference here. Romans 12. I beseech you brethren. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing. Of your mind. That you may prove. What is good. And acceptable. And perfect will. Of God. 
For I say through the grace given unto me. To every man that is among you. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly. According as God has dealt to every man. The measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So when you look at the psalm in, verse, in Psalm 23, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. A lot of people go to that psalm when they are in need of comfort. When they are in need of peace. Of some spiritual understanding. When they are in need of some restoring of the soul. Or when they are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Or when evil lurks about. It says in verse 6. That surely goodness and mercy shall follow all the days of our life. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Comforting thoughts. A destiny. An aim. That we have. When we look to Jesus. Jesus said. I am the door for the sheep. And he said I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life. For his sheep. I am. Means present tense. So. <clears throat> let us with confidence. Today. Say. This with all of our heart. That the Lord. Is my shepherd. 